Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, I am delighted today that I have got uh, somebody who probably is one of the most popular guests I've had for a long time. Uh, I had her on about a month or two ago. We were talking about the Night's Watch vows and oath uh, and I got a lot of really good feedback there so I'm delighted that she's come back on again. Um, do you want to say hi uh, Crowfeed's daughter Amanda? So, hi everyone, my name is Amanda, I go by Crowfeed's Daughter, and um, I have a YouTube channel, it's called The Distributed Lands, and um, you can also find me on Twitter at Crowfood underscore SD. So, thanks for having me, Robert, I appreciate it. Absolutely, it's uh, a pleasure. I got a lot of really good feedback there, so I'm delighted that she's come back on again. Um, you know what? Say hi, uh, Crowfeed's daughter, Amanda. I think, Amanda, you're, um, so you've got hi, the volume everyone. on your, your feed. Amanda, let me find out. I have a YouTube channel, it's called The Speed Land. Right here. And um, you can also find me on Twitter at Crowfood underscore SD. So thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, are uh, we all set again? I think we're all. I think we're all good. So if you just press, if you just press mute, mute on that, Amanda, then I think we're good to go again. Yep, we um, got it. Guys, we are going to be talking about the ghost of High Heart today, which is uh, one of my favourite topics because I think that she is a fascinating figure. Uh, we know so little about her. She's actually only appeared in two chapters of A Song of Ice and Fire, and yet when you start digging in, and I think we probably will in this live stream. The more you think about it, the more central she is, not just to the story that's going on at the moment, to the background, the history, how we got to where we are now in A Game of Thrones. A lot of it seems to have flowed through from her influence when she was uh, known as the Woods Witch. And we'll just pick up on that link uh, perhaps first. So Amanda, do you want to just uh, say who she is and uh, when we're talking about the Ghost of High Heart, and this was uh, one of my patrons, uh, Pegleg Pete. Hi, Pete, uh, with, I think, a slightly tongue-in-cheek question. Was there also a low heart? Okay, um, so first of all, the Ghost of High Heart, um, she is a albin albino dwarf woman. She is um, rumored to be a children of the forest. Uh, some people whisper that she was a children of the forest. Um, Jenny of Old Stones was one of her friends, and um, she actually uh, told people that she was one of the children of the forest. Um, she is uh, one of the people that actually accompanied Jenny of Old Stones when she went to, um, to King's Landing. She is the um, character that gave, um, I think it was um, Jaehaerys and uh, Shara the uh, prophecy that uh, the prince that was promised would come from their line. And um, and so she's the reason why Ares and Rayla actually were married. And so that, that was her doing right there. Um, also, let's see, um, we uh, find that throughout the story, uh, through those two chapters, we do have lots of prophecy going on with the Ghost of High Heart. She tells Beric Dondarrion quite a few different um, things and it's very, very accurate. So um, she's a very, very interesting character. We um, see that she has um, a part to play not only in the, the past, but also in the present. Um, and so she's kind of one of those old crone-like characters who's um, providing us with information, with visions, and um, she's very mysterious. She's very clouded in uh, mystery. So, um, and what was, the, what was the other question? Was there a... Uh, is that she's the ghost of high heart? Is there um, also a low heart? A low heart. So, um, so there's there's nothing that is actually uh, described as a low heart in the series. Um, high heart is it's a called the high heart because it is on a very very high hill, and it's crowned by um, uh, thirty one weirwood trees that that have been cut down. So weirwood's another name for them as a heart tree, and so you have this high hill with uh, lots of heart trees. So that's how it got its name, probably was High Heart. Um, however, uh, there is a phenomenon called, um, you know, the Hollow Hills phenomena, where um, children of the forest are known to live underneath Hollow Hills. And so, I mean, you might consider underneath High Heart to be Low Heart. Uh, there's, a, there's a great, um, there is a great thread on westeros.org that was uh, written by um, Liz the Smith. 
and he actually um, did a cataloging of the phenomena of um, hollow hills, caves, and, and tunnels. And um, if you're really interested in finding out more about that, that's a great um, thread to, to check out. Absolutely. I think that was a really helpful sort of overview uh, of who the ghost of High Heart is. So we've got two figures who we think are the same person. We've got the Woods Witch, who was from like a hundred or so years ago, uh, perhaps a little bit less, uh, who comes to the court with this character called Jenny of Oldstones. And then we've got the ghost of High Heart, who we actually see in A Song of Ice and Fire, she uh, is at this place, this hill called High Heart, and Aya and a few others sort of meet her twice. So they come to her in two different chapters. So we think uh, for a number of reasons, we'll probably mention a few of them as we go through, we think these are the same character. So I want to suggest that we start off with this, the first time we find out about her about this figure called the woods witch and guys i should just say uh thank you for the chat as always i'm going to be going from some questions i got from patreon uh, and obviously if there are any super chats we'll come to them straight away and we'll also try and pick up as many questions as we can from the chats we go through uh um i did i did spot uh who was it uh johnson baptiste uh dropped in a question saying apologies for not putting it on Patreon. Uh, somebody else did put a very similar question on Patreon, so we will definitely be picking up on that issue, John. But let's get back to the Woods Witch. So the Woods Witch comes with Jenny of Oldstones to the court. Now, who is Jenny of Oldstones, first of all, and why is she significant in terms of who becomes king, where the succession goes? Okay, so um, Jenny of Old Stones was actually um, a, they called her a, like a half wild child that uh, was um, uh, found frolicking around the uh, ruins of Old Stones. And so she, she's called Jenny of Old Stones because that's where she, she kind of tended to hang out. Um, and uh, they, they, you know, they talk about her wearing flowers in her hair. Um, she's very, you know, rooted with the nature and everything. Um, but it was uh, Prince Duncan the Small who fell in love with her. And Prince Duncan the Small was actually um, the, the next in line for the throne. And so um, when he fell in love with her, he was actually promised to be married to a, a daughter of, um, was it Ormond Baratheon? No, no, it was the Laughing Storm. Um, it, it, it was a, another Baratheon. But um, anyway, she, um, she, uh, stole his heart, and he ended up putting aside his betrothal for Jenny of Old Stones. And when that happened, it it caused a lot of um, issues because uh, if you see what happened with the phrase when when um, they were promised and and Rob fell in love with another woman, something kind of similar happened. They actually rebelled. Um, and he, the Storm King declared him, or the Storm Lord declared himself the Storm King. And um, anyway, because of this, Duncan the Small actually put aside his um, his uh, um, holdings and his title and, and everything that um, would make him the next in line. For, he, he basically put aside his um, uh, royal uh, place in, in line is what he did. And so the, because of that, um, he was no longer the next in line and he abdicated that. So that had a huge thing. Um, you know, it, he, he gave up his kingship for, for Jenny of Old Stones. Absolutely. So this is this is really significant, significant because we've got uh, uh, King uh, Aegon, Aegon the Fifth, who is Egg, who we know from Duncan Egg, and his eldest son is therefore taken out from the succession. And the succession then moves across to what we now know as being the succession. There was uh, Jaehaerys II, uh, who then was father of the Mad King, and then Rhaegar. So that whole line of succession, leading down obviously eventually to Danny and to John, that only happened because the ghost of High Heart, the Woods Witch, and Jenny of Oldstones came to King's Landing. So immediately we're going, huh, there's something, there's something going on here. She's clearly an important person to be mentioned in that way. Um, and 
Secondly, what happened um, is uh, this uh, issue about Summerhall. Now, what do we know? Uh, not much, I think, is the answer. But what do we know in terms of the link between uh, the Woods Witch and Summerhall? So um, the link between Summerhall and the Woods Witch, um, first of all, the Woods Witch mentioned um, that when she was talking to Arya, she mentioned that she gorged on grief at Summerhall. Um, and also when one of the um, Brotherhood's uh, Brothers Without Banners uh, was talking about her, about her and what happened to her, um, or was it... Or was it the conversation with Danny? Um, somebody asked what happened to uh, the ghost of Pyheart. I think what that happened? was Danny and uh, Sebastian. That was uh, yeah, Sebastian. And the answer was just, he just said one word, and it was Summer Hall. So um, through those, those two different um, passages, we learned that it's most likely that the ghost of Pyheart was present at Summer Hall, which, um, you know, can, can open, you know, a bunch of you know different questions up why she was there and um, what what the importance of that might be. Absolutely. So th this immediately starts alarm bells going in my mind. Is that we get this character who comes in who it seems quite children of the foresty, and immediately uh, her friend takes out where the line of succession was going to be and then this other line of succession happens and this other line of succession uh we get she gives a prophecy now i'm, I'm giving you lots of leading questions here amanda and i think that the, the reason is i'm wanting to us to sort of get towards some kind of shared understanding of what happened before trying to unpick what might have actually been going on so uh could you as a sort of a last thing that i'm going to throw to you to for you to explain what is the prophecy she gave about the next uh, or, or about the the other targaryens this new line that was suddenly the line uh of succession so the um prophecy that she gave was that uh the prince of the, that was promised would actually come from jaharis and uh shara's line um, and so that is why Ares and, and Rayla were um, wed was because because of that. So um, so that that plays a huge role in in a lot of things within the series because um, you know all the other um, children you know from the generation before they were able to follow their own hearts and um, Ares did was not. Um, and uh, we, we see that it, it actually um, was an accurate, fairly accurate prophecy, possibly. Um, so, so she was right in doing that. And it helps that if Duncan the Small was actually taken out of that succession, because then we see that the, the people that who are supposed to be um, providing us that prince that was promised line is now the Targaryen king, you know, the line of the Targaryen kings. So it actually, worked out fairly well when you when you look at it it did so so what we've got here is we've got uh, the ghost of high heart and jenny of old stones appearing in king's landing first of all uh, jenny gets together with the heir to the throne and the the what results from that is he gets out of the succession then there's also this prophecy that the ghost of high heart gives that says you know what so from jaharis's line that is where we're going to be getting the um uh, the the prince that was promised and that fundamentally led uh to the marriage of uh Aeris and Rayella, which led to Rhaegar and as you say down on through uh, after that to the characters that we have in in A Song of Ice and Fire. So uh, and then she's involved in Summerhall which takes out King Aegon and Prince Duncan and a few others as well. So they are central to all of these significant issues in terms of who becomes king and when in that period of time so, so that for me i think there's i'm going to get there's a couple of super chats i want to get to but that as a starting point for this discussion 
I, I want us to to have fixed our minds that something was going on there that seems a little bit too much of a coincidence. So it seems like if one of those things had happened, then perhaps, yeah, that may be that that could just be that those characters came along and did that. But three things happened within the short space of time that all led to the, the line of succession that we, we have now. Um, but I want to get to these uh, super chats quickly because there uh, are a couple of good questions coming in. Shadow Fox, uh, thank you very much uh, for for that uh, four pounds ninety nine. Thank you. Evening, you guys. Uh, you guys are two of the best content creators uh, for your information. Thank you very much. Um, is Maggie the Frog, who is the, uh, the 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 mage who gives the prophecy to Cersei when she was a young child? Is Maggie the Frog um, and the Ghost of High Heart? Are they connected? Uh, what, what do you reckon, Amanda? Are those two connected in any way? So I'm glad somebody asked this question. I, I actually, um, I do have some thoughts about that. Um, first of all, it's easy to make that connection. They're very, very short women. Um, they're very old women. Um, and they both provide prophecy. And they were both alive around the same time. And when you actually look at the... Um, <clears throat> When you actually look at the dates of everything, they were contemporaries of each other. So um, now with that, with them actually being contemporaries of each other, we see that uh, Maggie the Frog, she was actually, um, she was actually, it said she was brought from the East, um, married a wealthy Spicer, and um, they went to the Westerlands and their children became um, lords. Uh, they, they <clears throat> Titus Lannister granted them a lordship. Um, and Tidos Lannister was a um, was, was a lord was the lord of um, uh, the Westerlands between 244 and 267, but really it was 262. Around 262 is when uh, Tywin started taking care of everything, and so um, so really between 244 and 262 is when um, their children were granted a lordship, um, and at 276 is the turning of. At, um, Lannisport, and that's where we actually see uh, Maggie the Frog. Um, now, Maggie is described a little bit differently as well. Um, first of all, it said that she had a um, Eastern accent, so she talked a little bit differently than everyone else did. Um, she was squat and warty with pressed yellow eyes, no teeth, and pale green jowls. Um, and it's also said that she's, she had a different smell to her, um, and so um, with that, the ghost of High Heart is described as, as having milk pale white skin. Um, and it, it's not mentioned that she has a, a special accent or um, any of that. Um, now, with the, um, with the um, ghost of High Heart, she, um, Jenny of Old Stones met Duncan around um, 239 AC. And Summer Hall was 259. So during that time, she, the Ghost of High Heart was probably in and around court. She was in and around King's Landing with Jenny of Old Stones. So with Maggie the Frog um, being over in the Westerlands and being, you know, within the, you know, nobility circle of, of people, um, and the Ghost of High Heart being in King's Landing with the nobility circle of people. Um, I'm sure that there'd probably be some people that would have figured out that they were the same people. Um, so I don't think that they are the same person. Uh, but that's just my opinion on, on it. But they are very similar women. I, I agree completely with that. I think that for me, the biggest similarity and perhaps the reason why people uh, draw the links is the fact that they're both seemingly right. Now, there's an awful lot of uh, people who are magic users, who prophesy, who see things, but both of these, yes, they use quite uh, prophetic and poetic language to describe what's going on, but both of them seem to be quite accurate about what's going on. Doesn't mean they're gonna be right about absolutely everything. We've not seen the fulfillment of everything out of Maggie the Frog, uh, what Maggie the Frog said, but the stuff that uh, you can point at definitely did seem to be you know, pretty much on the nose. Same with the Ghost of High Heart. So there's, they're both good at it, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but I think that the physical descriptions, as you say, are different enough for us to say they're probably not the same person. And uh, I think that we uh, we should allow the world to be big enough to have more than one super good 
profit wandering around uh, at that sort of time. So I, I think I think I would agree completely. I don't I don't think they're the same. Uh, I don't. I, I think that they probably and the nature of magic is a much bigger issue. But they probably sort of tap into the same kind of magic power in some way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're the same person. So uh, I hope that one answered uh, that for you. We've got another um, excellent question that I was hoping we'd get onto, actually. Uh, so we'll just dive straight into it. Kerry McDonald, thank you so much for the super chat, uh, saying thanks for discussing one of my favourite subjects. You're very welcome. Do you think that Bloodraven could be connected to the Ghost of High Heart? Now, those of you who watch my channel a lot will know that one of my mottos is, if in doubt, blame Bloodraven. Now, uh, the, there is an obvious thing that I will kick off here, and then Amanda, perhaps you can bounce off of it, is that Blood Raven's colouring is clearly pale white skin, red eyes or red eye, and that's that's his thing. Uh, and then you get Ghost John Snow's direwolf, who he seems to be using in some way white fur, red eyes. Then you get the ghost of High Heart, who perhaps we'll get into in a moment about why he might be wanting to do this. Again, pale white skin, red eyes. So there does seem to be a thematic link going on there. But uh, what, what do you think? Do you think that there's, there's anything to this link? Well, I mean, it is mentioned, she does mention that the werewoods do whisper to her. And so it's, it's easy to make a connection with Blood Raven because he is connected to the Werewood Net. Um, and uh, he, she's getting very, very accurate uh, prophetic visions and prophetic dreams. So it, it's possible that Blood Raven is communicating with her. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to make that connection. Um, there, there are also some connections, possibly, um, that people have talked about in the forums with actually Blood Raven. Um, being her father. Um, and so it, there, I think the ideas of ice and fire, he did a video about the ghost of high heart and um, the possibility that leaf was her mother. Um, because as far as we know, the children of the forest are not present uh, below the wall um, in Westeros. Um, however, leaf actually for 200 years during the time of the dragon, she um, was walking around and um, hanging out you know, and learning, in, you know, the, the common tongue. And so Leaf was actually there. And um, when you look at um, one of the only men that know Leaf and one of the only men that would know about, you know, where was in the children of the forest, um, it is also hanging out in the Riverlands and is also an albino. Um, you know, you, you can make those connections as well. So there, I mean, there, there are, there is some tinfoil out there that um, Blood Raven could actually be her father. So, so that's there too. I think that, that that's fascinating. Actually, uh, Kathy Stark uh, asked a question on Patreon about this and about the link to Leaf, and I think you covered that one uh, really well. So uh, Kathy, I hope that one answers that for you. Um, I think that the, there's another link there with Blood Raven, which um, I'm not sure I, well, I have thoughts that follow on from this, but I'm just going to lay it out there. And this is a kind of a genealogy kind of uh, thing. So uh, if you think about Blood Raven, Blood Raven had a Targaryen uh, father and he had a um, Blackwood mother. Now, so that's his heritage. Now, what you'll find is that there is one other. Uh, Targaryen who married a Blackwood, and that was uh, Aegon the Fifth. Now, if you then say, okay, so from there, uh, their children must marry each other, and their children must marry each other. Actually, in terms of genetic heritage, you're going all the way down to Rhaegar having the same kind of mix of him of being Blackwood and Targaryen. So, if we were to type take Blood Raven is this kind of like mad eugenics kind of person, then that could indeed be the kind of thing that he could be trying to manipulate. Because if you remember, as we said slightly earlier on in this stream, the result of what happened with the Ghost of High Heart and Jenny of Old Stones was we got this line going down who had prophecy uh, written all over them with this, this prophecy about the prince that was promised, and their bloodline was the same 
Blood Ravens. Did you have any thoughts on that kind of idea about the idea that maybe Blood Raven was doing some uh, genetic meddling in some way? Well, I definitely think it's suspect that um, Egg found himself a Blackwood bride. Um, you know, it's it's um, pretty convenient. That's very special blood right there. And um, Blood Raven had a hand in just about everything in, in the, um, the kingdom and, and in the the workings of, of everything. And he was very steeped into magic. And so um, I, I don't think it was a coincidence that um, Egg found himself um, falling for a Blackwood woman. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely think that that's a possibility as well. Excellent. And uh, guys, uh, we're sort of dotting around a little bit with uh, with some of the questions from my patrons. So I'm just going to sort of pick up, uh, pick up. Uh, Ned Johnson was asking whether the ghost of High Heart was manipulating. Um, my headphones stopped working and I'm going to go, um, get a different, maybe I got it. Oh, can you say something? I'm going to go get a different set. Uh, do you want to go ahead and, and, um, answer that question? Um, and I'm going to go get a different set. Okay. Can you hear me now? No, I think, I think guys, I think it was me. Uh, if you can now... If you can now hear me, just put that in the chat. Apologies, that, that I think that was just my hardware that was going a bit wrong. Um, the, uh, the the question was um, uh, that uh, did the ghost of High Heart manipulate the fall of the Targaryens so that uh, we wouldn't we would get Robert being born eventually? I think no. I think that this is uh, this is an attempt by Blood Raven to manipulate the family tree to try and get the prince that was promised with the bloodline that he wanted. It wasn't about trying to bring down the Targaryens. I think that uh, Blood Raven would have been very happy for the Targaryens to stay in place and stay in power. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and Eric Dar, I'm also blaming these technical technical issues on Blood Raven. Um, uh, so, I think that's what was going on. I don't think it was about helping out the Baratheons or anything like that, I think that he was just trying to um, deliver the result that he was wanting. Um, now, uh, Joe Thompson was asking, what is the Song of Ice and Fire or Jenny's song? What are the lyrics? Um, he asked if I could sing it. Uh, I can't, and that's obviously not anything to do with whether I wish to sing anything. It is purely to do with um, uh, the fact that we don't have the tune, obviously. So apologies for that. Uh, we do, however, have um, a couple of lyrics or a couple of lines from uh, from Jenny's song. Uh, Amanda, I'm assuming you can hear me now. I think it was actually my fault at my end. My, uh, uh, my uh, uh, speaker thing got... Uh, microphone got unplugged so apologies that was uh, my fault not yours um we're we're going on to talk about uh, joe thompson one of my uh, patrons was asking about the song of ice and fire and jenny's song and do we know the lyrics now um i don't know whether you've got though i think we have got a couple of lines from uh jenny's song you're you're the kind of organized person who may be able to put your finger on that do you do you have that um one second i do um, I, I will keep talking while you you find it. So basically, okay. what, the, the reason why the reason why we have this is that uh, moving forward in time to when we get Aya encountering the ghost of High Heart, then uh, she gives her prophecies and she asks as payment for it for um, uh, the the bard that's that's there with the uh, the, the Brotherhood to sing her her Jenny's song. This incidentally is one of the links, one of the reasons why we're pretty sure the ghost of High Heart is uh, the Woods Witch from that there. So he, so she says, can you sing Jenny's song? Uh, and we hear, I think, the first couple of lines in the books. Did you, have you got that there? I do, I Fantastic. do. Uh, it says, high in the halls of the kings who are gone, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. 
And, um, and so I, I believe that that is a, a reference directly to old stones uh, because it says um, of the kings who are gone. And um, it mentions in, uh, I think it was the Catalan chapter, um, uh, does this castle have a name? He asked quietly, this is Rob talking, um, when she came up to him. Old stones, all the small folk called it when I was a girl, but no doubt it had some other name when it was still a hall of kings. And so it says, high in the halls of the kings who are gone, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. So um, the, the comment about the ghosts, it could be talking about the kings who are gone. It, it mentions um, in another area of the series that um, Jenny actually would claim descent from long dead kings. And so it could be talking about the, the long dead kings, or it could possibly be talking about um, the literal ghosts that we're talking about today. It could be talk she could be dancing with the ghosts of ghost of high heart. Um, so, so that, that's, I think what it's referring to. I think so. I think it's it's probably one of these double meanings that we've got there. So, uh, yeah, Old Stones, we don't know what it was originally called. It is, it's a ruin up in the sort of the northern riverlands uh, where Jenny came from. And so, yes, her dancing there is a sort of a, it's a reference to that, but also uh, a reference to Summer Hall, I'm sure, with this is, this was the Hall of the Kings. The Kings were there and that is where we think she died. So, she will forever be uh, poetically dancing there. And I th the the ghost of High Heart, the woods, which very much uh, she, she was there. And that was where she says she gorged on grief because of everything that was there. So if she's wanting to hear Jenny's song, that is the, the fundamental thing that she's going to be uh, thinking about and remembering. And uh, while we're on that from uh, Joe Thompson, the other part of that was asking about the Song of Ice and Fire, which is uh, perhaps a little tangent from this, but what's, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with my first take on the Song of Ice and Fire, and then perhaps you could pick up on it. I think the Song of Ice and Fire is a song, I think it is a song that uh, was uh, when we see in the vision that, that Danny has of Rhaegar and Elia uh, when he's saying about his son, his first son, Aegon, he says he has a song and his is the song of ice and fire. And then he starts singing a song. It's a sad song. I think that that song, it probably is the song of ice and fire. I think that he got this song as he did so many of his others from Summer Hall. And uh, one of my theories, as with many of my theories, not originally mine, I see many other people have thought this beforehand, uh, but I think that the ghost of High Heart stayed in Summer Hall afterwards when we talk about her gorging on it. It's not just that she spent an afternoon there watching the fire. That's not just her gorging on it. I think that she stayed there amidst the rubble and the ashes for a while, gorging on the grief. And we know that Rhaegar would go to Summer Hall. That was his place that he loved to go to the most on his own, spend long periods of time there and then emerge with songs. And these songs were beautiful and sad. And if we take this, uh, th these two people, the only two people that I've yet discovered who seem to spend significant amounts of time at Summer Hall, being the Ghost of High Heart and Rhaegar, if we assume that they met which makes sense. Summer Hall, it was a pleasure palace, so it was big but not so huge that you would miss somebody else who was there. It makes sense that if he met her and he realized who she was, this woods witch whose prophecy led directly to his birth, his existence, because otherwise his parents wouldn't have married, then surely he would have tried to record what some of the things that she said were. And all he had was his harp. And I think that he emerged with these songs that came from his conversations with her and her prophecies. And I think that is a very discreet uh, idea about what the Song of Ice and Fire is. I think it's got a much bigger, more thematic uh, reference as well that that is even more important than that, but but that's just one theory about the Song of Ice and Fire. What what do you think about the Song of Ice and Fire, um, Amanda? What what are your sort of thoughts? Um, I think that it can be uh, just as much metaphoric. Um, of course, the the series is called the Song of Ice and Fire, and um, 
when Rhaegar has has his baby in his hands, he, he calls that that baby the Song of Ice and Fire. But when we look at um, a character like John, who um, the mainstream theories say that he is the son of um, uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna, and so you have that ice and that fire, and and I, I tend to um, believe that that concept. And so um, when it says Rhaegar possibly thought that that child was the Song of Ice and Fire. Um, it, it could be a, a concept that he had found in a vision. It could be a concept that he read in a prophecy. But when we look at what um, the children of the forest um, are, they are the singers, those who sing the songs of the earth. And so um, you could say that um, when the White Walkers came, when they were created, that was the Song of Ice. And when they were defeated, it could possibly be the Song of Fire. And what's needed is a balance. And so what's needed is the song of both ice and fire, which is possibly in, um, you know, manifested in a person like a baby. Um, and so I, I kind of see it like that. I don't, it's possible it is a song because he says he has a song. Um, but I, I think it's, in my opinion, a little bit more metaphoric. I do believe Rhaegar wrote Jenny's song, though, um, because uh, it's um, a song very near and dear to his her heart, um, Rhaegar, she gets paid in songs, Rhaegar would go there, and it says, um, and he would go there alone, and whenever he came back, he would bring a song, and then you see it mentioned time and time again, he, he would play a sad song that would make women cry, um, he did it to Cersei, he did it to Lyanna, and, um, and it said that Jenny's song is a very sad song, so it's quite possible that he was singing Jenny's song to um, Lyanna and to Cersei. And it could possibly be Jenny's song that he was singing, um, that he was playing on that sad song um, on the heart when um, that baby was born too. Um, so I mean, that's a possibility too. It, it is, and I should I should probably clarify, I, I agree with everything you said, I think about the overarching uh, importance, the theme, uh, the, the, this, the Song of Ice and Fire above all is the theme of the whole uh, of, of this series of books. Uh, for me, I would personally emphasize uh, the, the, the ice being the, the, the others, the White Walkers, the fire being uh, the dragons, uh, and uh, the sort of the more Zora hypey part of the world. And then you need, as you said, the balance. And I think that the balance will be John. And I think that in order for us to get to a conclusion of this story, of this song, we need to have a balance of both forces both sides pushed back in a way so that humanity uh, freed from these two twin forces of, of of ice and fire i've quoted robert frost's poem too many times on these kind of live streams but i think that those two things could destroy the world and i think they both need to be pushed back so i agree completely uh with with that i i just uh in my wonderings and musings i do wonder i agree yes jenny's song i think was written by Rhaegar. i think also the song of ice and fire is also written by Rhaegar as a prophecy from the woods witch but that's I, I, I it, it's it's speculation that fits the facts for me rather than something I would live or die by. Um, but we do have another super chat. Shadow Fox, thank you so much. Another five pounds. Um, this is uh, getting us back to uh, the Ghost of High Heart saying, what prophecies from the Ghost of High Heart have still to come to pass and what are your predictions for them? Now, uh, I just very quickly picked up um, while we're doing this, what the the prophecies are and what the sort of the generally accepted uh, interpretations are. So she says, and uh, Amanda, perhaps after this, you can pick up on anything that you disagree with or if I missed any. So the old gods stir and will not let me sleep, she says. I dreamt I saw a shadow with a burning heart butchering a golden stag. That is quite clearly the shadow baby killing Renly Baratheon. Um, then uh, I dreamt of a man without a face waiting on a bridge that swayed and swung. On his shoulder perched a drowned, a drowned crow with sweet seaweed hanging from his wings. This uh, seems very much to be Euron hiring a faceless man to kill Balon Greyjoy on the show. He did it himself, but in the books it appears that he hired a faceless man to do it. I dreamt of a roaring river and a woman that was a fish 
Dead she drifted with red tears on her cheeks, but when her eyes did open, uh, oh, I woke from terror. And that seems to be Lady Stoneheart. So being dragged from the water from the river and brought back to this kind of unlife. Uh, then we get a few other ones saying, I dreamt of a wolf howling in the rain, but no one heard his grief. I dreamt such a clangor, I thought my head might burst drums and horns and pipes and screams. That seems very Red Wedding-y, uh, but the, sound, the saddest sound was the little bells. Um, I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. That seems to be about Sansa, the purple wedding, because if you remember, she brought the poison in in her hairnet, the poison that killed Joffrey. Uh, and then later I dreamt that maid again, slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. And that for me, uh, and this I think will be where I'm going to, throw over to you Amanda that for me is the one that hasn't clearly in the books clearly been uh, fulfilled yet so uh, did I, first of all did I miss anything that you that you know in terms of her big prophecies uh, and secondly what would you think that is well I think I think you nailed them um, I'm gonna tell you what I hope that is I, I hope that is Sansa um, slaying Little finger killing litter, little finger. Um, Peter Baelish, he has the the Titan of the uh, Titan of Bravos as a sigil, which is basically a giant. And so you could consider um, Peter because in a lot of the different um, prophecies, especially with um, the Ghost of High Heart, she calls um, a woman who was a fish. Well, uh, Catalan was a Tully, and their sigil is a fish. So um, you could call if you're looking at people in a metaphoric way with their sigils, uh, Peter Baelish would be a giant. And so Sansa is slaying the savage giant would be um, her possibly slaying Peter Baelish. And um, I would like to see that. Um, and so it is foreshadowed, um, you know, but there's also with the, the castle that she built with the snow and um, Sweet Robin and, and um, uh, her, her getting mad at Sweet Robin because of the castle that she built of Winterfell and, and him. I think they mentioned, I'm a giant, I'm a giant. He was like stomping around on it. So it could actually just be referring to that little scene there. And so it's kind of ambiguous. It could have already um, taken place, uh, but I, I hope not. I, I hope it's foreshadowing Peter Baelish's death. Yeah, I, I I think that's right. I don't I, I I think that was foreshadowing. I don't think that that was the fulfilment of it because these seem to be the things that she was uh, prophesying about seem to be quite big things. They're about deaths of kings and and uh, uh, Catelyn, Star uh, Catelyn Stark being brought back from the dead and things like that. These are quite significant events. And just uh, Sansa playing in snow doesn't for me feel the same kind of thing. So I think there's something bigger going on there that has yet to happen. I think that the only thing that I would hold against the little finger theory is that although yes, House Baelish had the uh, the giant, the Titan of Bravos as its sigil, he personally took the Mockingbird as his own sigil. So that doesn't, for me, that doesn't quite work out. I do wonder whether it's something to do with uh, House Umber because uh, that they have a a giant as, as part of their sigil, um, but I think that it is definitely something to do with the the retake of Winterfell in some way. That's my my guess. I say definitely. That's my guess. Anyway, um, we just uh, just to pick up uh, on something I saw just to quickly go through on the uh, chat. Somebody was asking why the Ghost of High Heart is called the Ghost of High Heart. Well, I think this is. A um, couple of reasons, firstly, that uh, High Heart, the, the place itself, Amanda said right at the top of the live stream, uh, this is this hill and it's got the uh, the 31 uh, chopped down weirwoods, the weirwood stumps uh, on its top. And the, the people who lived in the area gave it a wide berth because there, they said it was haunted. The ghosts were there, the ghosts of the, the children of the forest. Uh, and so if they suddenly see this uh, short white uh, figure who looks a bit like a, one of the children of the forest, then 
yes, they would immediately start saying this is a ghost of High Heart. So that is a sort of a colloquial thing. So that is why she's called the ghost of High Heart uh, more than anything else. Um, uh, we've got uh, Super Chat, $10. Thank you very much from, uh, and and I have to say thank you so much for changing your uh, your username to House Crack and Tacos. Um, so uh, uh, thank you for answering my question, both of you. You're, you're very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm starting to get a reputation for Crack and Tacos to the point that people are changing their username, which is... Uh, a, Scary but delightful. Thank you so much. Um, let's take a very quick pause uh, there because I, I did want to say uh, something to uh, my subscribers, uh, patrons, and everyone who watches this. Uh, as as some of you in the chat uh, know, because uh, I tweeted out about it uh, a bit, bit ago, earlier today this channel reached forty thousand subscribers, and I am absolutely blown away. I'm really uh, I'm excited, but also I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, this is just me doing this, but I cannot do this with the support of so many different people and uh you know who you are if, if you've been supporting me uh and and if you've just been watching my videos you've been supporting me too so thank you um uh, and, and i mean that uh, completely it's uh it's it's as i say it's it's humbling Forty thousand is a figure that i never thought i would get to so Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of other stuff that's coming up uh, on on the channel, um, I would just say I'm carrying on with my work through of the uh, what I think happened in Robert's Rebellion, turning at Harren Hall in the Tower of Joy. We're going to have the the second part of my sort of. Uh, epic length, I was going to call it epic, well that's probably overstating it, epic length videos on uh, what happened in the actual rebellion itself and this time I'm going to be looking from Ned's perspective. Last time we were looking at the, the, the rebellion more from Robert's side about all of the battles that he did and bringing his army all the way around the south and how the Targaryens lost from this position of apparently great strength. Uh, but this time we're going to look at Ned looking at the stuff with the fisherman's daughter, what happened with Catelyn, uh, all the way up to the point where we, we work out or try to figure out how on earth he knew where to go to try and find uh, Lyanna. So that's that's what's coming up uh, soon. Uh, also, you might want to check out my other channel, The Well-Told Tale, where uh, which is basically me reading audiobooks, what I consider to be the best science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. And we're now three episodes into Frankenstein. So if you, if you like that, please do check it out. There's a link down there in the description. There's also a link in the description if you are interested in becoming a patron uh it is the the best way to support this channel um and you also get a whole load of other patron only benefits so uh, thank you so much uh to my patrons i cannot do this without you uh but amanda what have you got coming up on on your channel in in, in your world what's uh what, what do you want to flag people towards so um, I do have a YouTube channel, it's called The Disputed Lands, and um, I do a lot of Ironborn videos, but I'm, I'm actually switching over to do a few videos about um, the concept of King's Blood. And my next video is actually going to be about the voice in the flames, and I, I actually think I may have figured out what's going on there. Um, so hopefully we'll get that in a couple weeks. And um, otherwise, you can find me on Twitter. It's uh, at crowfood underscore SD. And that's all I got. <laughs> Fantastic. And guys, I, you know by now I only have people on here if I would personally recommend their channel or their work. And uh, if you haven't checked out The Dis Disputed Lands, uh, I'm pretty sure I put a link down in the description, but I'm sure the moderators will drop a link down there in the chat as well. Uh, do go and check it out. Uh, Amanda does uh, excellent content, I, I would say, uh, with an emphasis on the word excellent. So please do go and uh, check that out. She does some fantastic stuff. And I'm really intrigued about the the voice in the flames so uh, I shall be having a, a look for that one. Um, uh, Patricia Albert or Albert, uh, thank you very much for uh, 10 euros just saying thanks for all the videos you are very welcome. Um, okay so let's uh, let's let's come back to um, the uh, the subject of summer hall. Now um, uh, Brian Price, one of my patrons, said, "What's the deal with summer hall, Robert? I feel like you're holding out your theories on us." Now I uh, I know why you're probably thinking that because for about the last two or three live streams, I've sort of 
hinted at the fact that I think that there's something else, something more going on there without ever sort of fully explaining what my theory is. Now, to sort of put that into context, the way that I tend to work is that I... Uh, I identify, I look at things that I do not personally fully understand or things that I don't think quite add up and then I start investigating them and I try and figure out what's going on and I go down all the different little uh, rabbit holes I can find all over the place until I feel I'm satisfied that I've got at least a working hypothesis about what's going on. With Summer Hall, I, I was at the point a while ago where I thought that doesn't quite add up for me, just this the story that we've sort of been given which is that this was just a uh, egg on the fifth doing an experiment with a bit of fire and some dragon eggs that just got out of control that d there seemed to be something else there couldn't quite put my finger on it i haven't yet fully flushed out fleshed out even what i think the that the right solution is but a lot of the things that are going on here for me tie in with that so i think that there was definitely Aegon was trying to um, hatch some dragons. I think that's reasonably clear. But it's also clear to me that Bloodraven was trying to create this uh, line of succession where you ha got Jaehaerys and then uh, Aerys and then Rhaegar on down. And I think that part of that seems to be what happened in Summerhall. So the extent to which Bloodraven was involved in this is the bit that I'm just trying to work my way through. At the moment, we know that uh, that uh, the, the Ghost of High Heart was there, and we've already teased out a few of the links between her and Bloodraven. I think it's reasonably clear that, that he or the Weirwood Network were talking to her, and that was what led to her prophecy. Uh, and so the question is, what is the extent to which she was involved in what was going on there? Um, did you, as I say, I've not reached a full conclusion on this one, Amanda, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Did, what are your thoughts on what happened at Summer Hall over and above the sort of the the obvious thing? Do you think there was any extra layer of stuff going on there? Well, I, I tend to look a little bit suspiciously at Aries. And um, first of all, there, there's probably a reason why they chose Summer Hall. They, they have a few different keeps and castles where this could have happened. Um, they have Dragonstone, which is a very large, um, not so flammable place made of, um, you know, Dragonstone that supposedly you can't burn. Um, and also you have King's Landing. Um, and so they chose Summer Hall. And when you look at it, who is probably actually living in Summer Hall, it's normally the, the next in line is going to be at Dragonstone. So you have Aegon V and he is over there at the Red Keep. And then the next in line is going to be Jahari. So he's going to be at Dragonstone. And you have a couple options for, for Summer Hall. You have either Duncan the Small or you have, um, but he abdicated his his line of su succession. Or you have um, Ares, okay? And now Ares, the reason why they probably chose Summer Hall was because of how pregnant uh, Rayla was. And so she was, what, nine months pregnant? Um, and so they probably chose um, Summer Hall so that the, the, the blood of the dragon could actually gather as one so that Rayla could be pre present. And so um, the person that was probably there, uh, living there at Summer Hall was probably Ares and Rayla. Um, and then if you think of, you know, if this was an inside job, that there was sabotage, um, the person that would be able to sabotage it would probably be the person that actually lived there. And um, if you look at the person that had the most to gain from um, Summer Hall, Ares, you know, he gained quite a bit. Um, you know, his, his father didn't die, but he only lived for like three, you know, he only ruled for about three years and then Ares took over. And so um, also if you look at um, Ares' love of wildfire, if your entire family died in a huge wildfire accident, you probably wouldn't love the stuff and want to keep it around everywhere. I mean, the guy made a pyromancer his hand of the king. And so he he like loves this stuff and, and he um, want, ma wanted to make more and more. And um, he didn't have a fear of it either because he, he had it carried, kept everywhere. So, um, you know, I, I tend to look suspiciously at Ares himself. And um, if you look at the um, vision with, 
um, Duncan, when he's burying Chestnut, he sees a vision of most of the people that were in the storyline, you know, dying of this battle. They see, he sees the wounds of all these people dying in the battle, but Egg doesn't die of wounds in this vision. He dies of being um, buried in sand. And when you look at the um, precautions that Tyrion, um, it, he discusses with the um, alchemists, what they do is they have this like trap roof and this roof above it, it's all sand so that it can, um, uh, if the flames get too high or too hot, the sand comes down. And so though that's probably, um, that, that could have been a prophetic vision of what actually happened to Egg. And so this, um, uh, the, the safeguards that were there were probably what, what could have um, had a hand in actually killing some of these Targaryens as well. So I, I tend to look suspiciously at Ares because I think that he had motive. I think that he had opportunity. And I, I don't think that he looks at um, wildfire the way that a person who has had that traumatic of an incident uh, should. So he, he looks at it, at it like it's a friend. And um, so, yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. I think that's uh, that's absolutely fascinating. I love it. And uh, when I do, and I, I have no idea when I, I, I will, but when I do make my uh, summer hall video, then I will uh, definitely include that, that. That that was a fantastic link there between the sort of the buried in sand and the what's what's going on in the uh, the the alchemists. Um, I've forgotten what they call it now. The their main place in the the King's Landing. The uh, was, was, sorry. The Alchemist Guild. The Alchemist Guild, yeah, and on the the Street, street of Sisters in uh, in King's Landing, and with the sand, the trapped all that. So I thought that was a fantastic link. So uh, guys, if I mention that in my video, this is me giving due credit to Amanda. Uh, so yeah, it, it wasn't me. I watched a video um, with uh, History of Westeros. They they actually uh, talked about it a little bit in their little little thing. But so uh, History of Westeros, check it out. <laughs> Well, we all bow before Aziz's superior yes. knowledge of everything, let's yes. face it. Yes. Um, uh, okay, so uh, in terms of Summer Hall, then, I, I think where I'm at, and it sounds to me like where, where Amanda's at, is that we, we don't have a full answer. There are lots of questions. There are a few different people who seem to have uh, an interest in that happening. You've pointed out Eris, I've pointed out Bloodraven. I, I wonder, there's also the other link that people often draw with Eris and Bloodraven, the burn them all. At what point did he put that thought in his mind? If it that was indeed him, when he's saying burn them all, everyone says, oh, this must be him trying to get him to burn all the White Walkers. Maybe it's other people, maybe Summerhall, I don't know. Uh, just. There's lots of links there that at some point soon I will, I promise, turn into a video. Um, uh, but let's uh, let's move on to, uh, and in a moment we're going to um, come to questions in the chat. Kid28, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the super chat saying congrats on the 40k subs and add one more patron to the list. Thank you so much. That's fantastic news. Um, uh, but uh, so guys, if you want to start dropping a f uh, some questions into the chat, we're going to start uh, pulling them out from there, I, I think, for the, 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 the next section here of the uh, uh, of the conversation, uh, but just in terms of where from here, in terms of the ghost of High Heart, we've got we've got this character who's involved back in the history, and then we've got this character who is sort of prophesying uh, in the present, and most, but not all of those things seem to have happened already. Do you think? Obviously, this character isn't in the show but is very much in the books. Uh, it's not just Aya and the Brotherhood Without Banners who know about her. Tyrion's heard the rumour that there's somebody there as well. Uh, Cersei, through a bizarre route, also heard this rumour as well. Uh, so it is starting to get known around the kingdom that there is this figure there. Do you think we're going to see her again in the next two books? And if so, in what way? You know, I really hope so, because um, she is one of the few people that were at Summer Hall that are alive still. So if we're going to learn more about Summer Hall, that it's not going to be like a, um, a vision and, you know, the Weirwood Net or 
or maybe we'll we'll learn some more in another way. The the most likely way that we're going to learn more about Summer Hall because she talks about Summer Hall. It's not like this isn't something that she talks about. She's had a gorge of grief at Summer Hall. Um, we may be learning what happened uh, during Summer Hall from this character. So I, I really hope that we do get a seer because um, George has, has mentioned a couple times that he wants Summer Hall to be very mysterious and shrouded in mystery. So if we're ever going to, you know, remove that call and find out what happened, it's probably going to be through this character. So um, it, I've got my fingers crossed, I, uh, but if hopefully that's what he's doing with this character is, is going to be providing us with the information that we need. Yeah, I've, I, perhaps I'm not as optimistic as you. I just have this feeling with uh, the, the, the mystery of Summer Hall is that we're not actually going to find out exactly what happened until the very last Duncan Egg story. I have this horrible feeling that we're going to have to wait oh, no. all the way through A Song of Ice and Fire and then him writing 10, 12, who knows how many of the Duncan Egg stories before we finally get to the one he said this is going to go through their life. So the, the, the last one has to be what happened at Summer Hall. And I have a feeling we're not going to find out exactly what happens until then. But I agree completely that I would love her to be uh, the, the character to appear at some point in the next couple of books. I have a feeling that, um, as, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the, the, the others are not... The, the, they're not heading towards King's Landing in the way, I, I think, in the books, in the way that they probably will on the show, because I think the centre of things has to be the Isle of Faces. That's that's the sort of very much the, the heart of the Weirwood Network, as we understand it. And she is not very far from there. This is also, she's very much hooked up to the Weirwood Network. Bran is now getting hooked up into the Weirwood Network. I think that it's, it's almost certain, uh, as far as I can, as far as I'm concerned, that she will be involved in some way uh, with what happens, if only warning people about a few more things that are going to happen. We've had people go there twice, get prophecies and go away again. If, if, I, if I knew about this, then I would certainly go back and try and get a few more prophecies and try and find out what was going on. So I think she probably will, but uh, can't guarantee it. I, I did. George R. R. Martin most recently said, expect them to be complicated, the, the, the last uh, couple of books. So I think that means that there's still going to be a huge amount of characters. Um, uh, and just going to the uh, chat, uh, someone, I think it was 26 Art Girl, was saying, what was the real relationship between the Ghost of High Heart and uh, Jenny of Old Stones. Now, um, I'm not entirely sure which angle you're, you're coming at that from. Uh, my take is that Jenny of Old Stones was this kind of free spirit uh, up there in a ruined castle, dancing around in a ruined castle. And then the, the Ghost of High Heart, I think, probably guided by the Weirwood Network and by Blood Raven, went and took her and brought her along and was this kind of protector and guide to her. But they became friends, and then that relationship deepened between the two of them. I don't think we know enough to speculate any further than that, whether there was another layer to their relationship. I don't know, but certainly that seems to be uh, a genuine relationship which built up between Jenny and Duncan. Uh, whether there was some sort of magical matching that happened to start with, I don't know. Uh, but but what do you think? What was? How would you characterize that relationship between the Ghost of High Heart and Jenny of Old Stones? Okay, so um, like the the song says, high in the halls um, of the kings who are gone, uh, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. And it's mentioned in the Catelyn chapter, she calls Old Stones the Halls of Kings. And of course, they, she also talks about the kings that are gone in, in that chapter. So it's most likely mentioned, uh, they're most likely introducing Old Stones and Jenny in, in that song. Um, and it says Jenny would dance with her ghosts. Now, if they were such great friends, the, the ghost of High Heart probably didn't start out in High Heart. She probably was with Jenny in Old Stones if they were such good friends and it, their, their relationship is described as friends. And so um, we don't have any solid evidence to point to anything else. Um, I have heard theories and I've seen theories that have uh, mentioned that Jenny would be the um, possibly the daughter of um, 
of the ghost of high heart. And that, that does make a little bit of sense when she calls her my Jenny, um, like, like almost like a mother would and, and about the, um, the love and the sorrow that she feels, um, you know, when she hears that song and, you know, this has happened what 40 years ago and she's still, you know, completely heartbroken about it. Um, so, you know, there's that theory, but right now there's really not a lot of evidence to support that. Um, those who believe that uh, the ghost of High Heart is um, descended from the children of the forest. Uh, when we look at Leaf, Leaf um, actually has uh, withered flowers in her hair. And of course, Jenny of Old Stone also, you know, it's said in the song with flowers in her hair. So there's, there's a very small connection. But as far as we know right now, um, they are described as friends and we at least for the meantime, we, we have to believe it as that because there's not a lot of anything else to back it up. Uh, but I do I do like um, reading those tinfoil theories about possible the possible familial uh, connections between all of them because um, it, it does make it a little bit more interesting when you you actually read that. So, uh, but for the moment, for the moment, um, friends. So. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think Friends is definitely uh, the the main thing that's going on there. Incidentally, while you're you're talking about that, and my, my mind went to, on a complete tangent, uh, but it's just something that I've uh, noticed last time I was looking on the map of Westeros, as you do, is that we often think about this, the the old gods and the power of of the old gods and, and the weirwoods as being in the north, but not in the south, but you could actually draw a sort of a very vague corridor of this continuing influence that sort of comes down from the neck, heads down so you get sort of to the to the west of uh, of the river, so to the uh, to the to the west of the twins, uh, down to you get old stones is actually up there. Uh, that then then you can sort of come down. You you not too much further down from south from that you get House Blackwood, who obviously also keeps to the old gods. Then you come down. Uh, that you can get a little bit further you, you get uh, deep into the riverlands now you're getting the uh, the god's eye and the isle of faces and then high heart is just the other side there so you get this you've got this sort of corridor that's going on so if you're if you think that it's just to the north that uh, follows the uh, the old gods then it's it isn't and in fact this was one of the things that came up in that extract uh, that George R. R. Martin recently released from uh, Fire and Blood when you get good Queen Alisane who is trying to persuade some northerners that that it's okay to be marrying some southerners and she sort of says you know well, actually we've got quite a few I can't remember the exact number she plucks out of the air so like a dozen or so double how many was it? A dozen. She said a dozen. It, is, it was a dozen. Ah, a good guess on my part then. Uh, all my memory is better than I think it is, uh, who still follow the old gods. So uh, the, the, there is this sort of uh, uh, root where where the root is probably the wrong wrong word, but uh, but they're, they're some within the Riverlands still follow the old uh, gods. But uh, we've had a couple of super chats. Um, Anime Lover, uh, thank you very much, 5 euros 49. Uh, do you think the ghost uh, of High Heart has to come to the Red Keep because of Cersei? Um, uh, I, I don't quite follow the logic there. Uh, uh, I don't think so. I, I, personally, I think that's that um, Cersei and King's Landing is a little bit of a diversion away from what the whole Blood Raven Ghost of High Heart vision is about, which is about the North. But uh, Amanda, is there something I'm, I've, pardon me, I've missed there? Well, you know, she is looking for a dwarf and um, because of that, and she's offered a, a lordship and a huge reward because of that, all, all these people are bringing dwarfs and the heads of dwarfs and beheading them. And people that would, you know, be obviously not be um, uh, Tyrion, but they're still doing it anyway. One of them was uh, Penny's brother, in fact. Um, and so, I mean, there's this possibility that they see a dwarf and they think, you know, hey, I can get a lordship. Um, and so I, I, I hate to, for that to happen. Um, I, I think that it, I think that it was mentioned to Cersei uh, that hey, we have reports of this dwarf in the you know in the Riverlands and albino and blah blah blah, and she you know dismissed that. 
So, um, so hopefully she doesn't have to come for or, or lose her head for for anything. But there are those people who are are um, fortune hunters that want a lordship that could just see her and, and think it's easy money, um, and that would be really unfortunate. Um, but the coolest thing about um, them mentioning uh, the ghost of High Heart because she's trying to find all all of these, you know, she's trying to find Tyrion and, and trying to find out a lot of stuff is. Um, if she would have looked into it, she would have met a, a woman that provides a really um, prophetic prophecy and could have been really helpful to her. But she was like, no, I'm, I'm good. But um, yeah, I, I don't think that we're going to see her over at the Red Keep. No, I, I'd, I'd agree. So uh, no, I don't think the ghost of High Heart has to come to the Red Keep. Uh, but I, I think that's that's a good point that, that there's there are these bounty hunters that are going around looking for dwarves and uh, as yeah, as we mentioned earlier she had heard the rumor so it's it's possible but I think actually it's probably more likely that she stays uh, up there hidden and being quite ghost-like only appearing when she wishes to uh, will uh, Ravo Ravo uh, two pounds thank you very much uh, why was the ghost of high heart scared of Arya? This is excellent uh, question. I've got again what she said. Um, so this is when the second time when Arya goes there, uh, suddenly the Ghost of High Heart rounds on her and she says, I see you, I see you, wolf child, blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. This is talking about Beric Dondarrion. You are cruel to come to my hill. Cruel, I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart, be gone. Um, so I think the answer here is actually pretty straightforward, that I, uh, for, for somebody who can, like the Weirwoods, see things uh, ahead of time and behind things that have happened, as well as stuff that's happening right now, I uh, must reek of death because she brings death upon people. That is her whole, whole story arc. There, Where she was going to was to Bravos in order to train to be this killer. Uh, uh, so what uh, the Ghost of High Heart did not want was to have death brought to her because she'd had enough of death. And incidentally, there's, um, I forget which, which one of the, uh the um the brotherhood says it but one of them just mentions offhand that you know this is a safe place no one can die here no one can be killed here it's it's there, there's a, a sort of an aura about high heart that actually makes it a place of peace rather than a place of killing and so that is probably why not just because of the uh, the weirwoods but probably why she ended up there as, as much as anywhere else but is there anything else there in terms of Aya that you think that worth adding well there are some connections between the faceless man and the children of the forest uh, if you look at the faceless men they actually sit on weirwood and ebony chairs and the the door to the uh, faceless men um, to their their um, uh, to the uh, what is it called the church or the faceless not the church um, but the door the house of black and white the house of black and white thank you oh um, the door is ebony and it's also weirwood so when we're introduced to the house of black and white um, we are introduced to weirwood and ebony. And there are some possible connections between the concept of eb ebony and the concept of weirwood. I I've got a video about it, but it it's a thing. So um, anyway, so we see, we are introduced to it. Um, they sit on these chairs like green seers sit on weirwood thrones. And um, they're also called the faceless men and the, the weirwoods, the old gods are, are also called the, the nameless faceless gods and the faceless men are nameless and faceless. Uh, uh, there's a channel called Up From Under Winterfell uh, by Maester Mary, and she actually takes apart um, the House of Black and White and shows the connections to the children of the forest. So it, it's possible that she sees that connection there between Arya, and, and it's a foreboding connection that she sees. It's, it's something that she doesn't like, which is interesting. So um, so there's there's that possibility that she's actually seeing something familiar and something um, evil, something wrong, so, you know, uh, so definitely check out that video. Um, 
and she's got, I think, a three-part series on Bravos from up from under Winterfell. Yeah, absolutely. Do check that out. Um, uh, Maester Mary does good stuff as well. Uh, the, uh, there's a couple of people in the chat pointing out that the this in terms of grief and the the way that uh, the ghost of high heart was phrasing it was saying i don't need any any of your grief and so perhaps that is also connected to her prophecy about the red wedding and so she's actually seeing in in advance Arya's grief about that and maybe she's experiencing that and i think that's all that's a really valid point uh i i always always say that there are cleverer people in the chat than there are often are uh, who are d d doing this myself included um are there any uh, amanda have you spotted any other questions in the chat that you think we should be picking up on um let's see um I'm never good at looking at these. Um, could it be Arya's grief related to her? Oh yeah, that's what you mentioned. Um, I would like to talk about the connection. If you want to look for a um, good question. Um, oh, uh, Wisna Smith mentions, yes, the singers hooked up to the roots in Blood, Blood Raven's cave would maybe support the idea of the Hollow Hills caves and tunnels all over Westeros. So there's that other connection between the Hollow Hills and when you look at old stones, old stones is most likely a hollow hill as well. Um, and this is something that I wanted to mention was the connections between um, the high heart and old stones. Um, when Merritt Frey goes up to um, old stones, it actually takes him the good part of an, a day and the road goes twice up the hill. And it's like this flat area and all of a sudden you just see this hill rising. Um, and there's lots of connections between the forest. It's a heavily, heavily forested area. He said that anybody could be hiding because the forest is so dense. So you get lots of, lots of mentions with this hill and forests and lots, lots of connections with like the old gods and everything with two old stones. And um, when you learn about old stones, the very first chapter that you learn about old stones, it's with Catalan. And they talk about the kings that are gone, you know, with Christopher the fourth. And that's mentioned with Jenny of Oldstone. She says that she is a descendant of those long dead kings. So we learn about Tristopher the Fourth, the Hammer of Justice. And then when we go to High Heart, we learn about another guy, um, totally different guy. This guy is called Eric the Kinslayer. And Eric the Kinslayer is the guy that chopped down all of those trees. Um, and it said that the children of the forest and the first men banded together and they uh, tried to uh, fight back the Andals, but Eric the Kinslayer chopped down the trees anyway. And um, anyway, so we're given Christopher the Fourth when we get to Old Stones. And we're get, given Eric the Kinslayer when we go to um, High Heart. And we're not really making any connections. However, in the World Book, when we're actually reading about Christopher the Fourth, the paragraph after after that it says, "In that same era, Eric the Kinslayer." you know, chop down all these trees. So you quickly learned that um, it said that Christopher the fourth fought 99 battles, but lost his 100th. You quickly come to realize that that 100th battle was probably for High Heart. It was probably, you know, because in that same era, Eric the Kinslayer was there. So you see a connection between this um, hammer wielding guy who is connected with the children of the forest and possibly aligned with the children of the forest, fighting this kin slaying, tree hating um, guy that's cutting down werewoods. And so it's, it's very interesting. I actually have an entire video about those two archetypes. And so um, it's about the great king and Garth the Green Hand. And um, anyway, it's, it's something kind of interesting to see is the connections between those two characters and those two locations. So um, anyway, check that out if you want. Yeah, I love it when there are there, there are connections uh, between thematic connections between between two characters that you might otherwise not uh, see. One uh, that at some point I'm going to explore is the the, the thematic connection between Bloodraven and Beric Dondarrion, uh, because as well as the fact they've both got one eye um, and the fact that they're sort of living well 
beyond when they should be living um, uh, and they are doing what they think is right for the realm even though perhaps many people don't necessarily know what they're doing or understand what they're doing also when they're introduced there's a lot of links in the way that they're described they're both described as sitting in thrones of weirwood root uh, which is uh, an astonishing thing not just for uh, when we first think about blood raven who is a uh, obviously a targaryen but then also when you're thinking about beric dondarrion who's been raised by the red god apparently so uh, these are links between these two characters are, are drawn deliberately um i've just noticed that i missed a super chat uh, so uh, i'm really sorry uh, uh, Higa Herger, uh, who I love when uh, Higa Herger does Super Chats simply because I love saying Higa Herger. Um, but uh, the just uh, two dollars, thank you so much for that saying. Just saying hi, new views on Game of Thrones, always welcome, absolutely. And this is why uh, I have people like Amanda on because I, I don't just want to give my views here i want you to be able to see views and thoughts from from other people who see things from slightly different angles because i've not got a monopoly of wisdom on this by a long way there are lots of people who understand stuff that i don't who have insights and knowledge about specific things that i haven't looked at uh, and amanda's one of those people so that's why i have her on here as well as others who uh, who can help shape a, a rounded view about what's going on so uh, so thank you for that um, someone uh, I uh, I'm trying to find ah Steph Snow. I just wanted to pick up. This was uh, wasn't a super chat, but I spotted it saying, "Will Summer Hall be featured in the Unseen Throne exhibit?" Uh, now I just wanted to mention this because uh, I've I've agreed to be, and I can't remember what the the, the term they use. I think a partner was the term that they uh, they come up with uh, to help them promote the Unseen uh, Thrones exhibition. Now for those who don't know what this is, these are the people who did the concept art for Game of Thrones, the TV show, so the original bits of concept art, art over the series, um, and they are putting on an exhibition, it's going to be in Berlin in J J January, I think, of next year, uh, and it's them putting their art up there, it's fully supported by George R.R. R. Martin, and it's going to be free entry, uh, obviously, it may cost some people quite a bit to get to Berlin, but it's it's free entry, and uh, and so they haven't got a budget for promotion, so they've asked people like me and a number of other YouTubers uh, to be advertising it. So I'm very happy to do that. Um, if you if you've not seen it uh, advertised anywhere, then hopefully one of the mods might be able to drop something into uh, the the uh, the chat. But it's uh, unseen thrones. Uh, and I would highly recommend that people do check that out. Uh, in terms of Summerhall, I don't know if Summerhall is going to be on there. I suspect not because it's not really been on the show. There are some things that are the, the kinds of things that are there are the kind of the original concept art that some of which didn't make it to the show. Like, for example, I saw a couple of. Uh, of images of uh, Naga's ribs, Naga's hill from over on the Iron Islands and Old Wick that never really made it. If you remember when we had the King's Moot there, they were, it was a very dramatic scene, but we didn't have those uh, uh, those those huge white ribs that were, were uh, there that uh, that should have been forming the backdrop of that. Uh, that is in the concept art, but it wasn't actually on the show in the end. So uh, I don't think Summerhall's going to be on there, but. Uh, have a look, check it out. Um, and there are a couple of other super chats I think I saw from Brian Price. Um, uh, hi, Brian. Uh, I, we answered your question earlier. I hope you picked up on that one. But saying, late to the chat, Melisandre says, only death can pay for life. Are there any implications for this on the whole story and potentially for summer hall? Uh, I talked about this last time in my live stream, so I'm going to let, and as I've just been waffling for a little while, I'll let Amanda say a, a, a few words on this. What do you think the link here between only death can play, pay for life is and some hall specifically and also for the bigger story? Okay, I actually want to talk about a similar saying, but uh, something a little bit more specific. Um, Melisandre she's mentioned that only death can pay for life but what happened in center summer hall is they actually tried to um hatch stone dragons they tried to wake dragons from stone and um it is said that um uh, it is said that um a king's blood only a king's blood can wake the stone dragons 
And so um, Melisandre, she is extremely fixated on the Azor High prophecy, and she wants to hatch dragons from stone. She wants to do what Aegon had had attempted, what um, what Arion had attempted. She she wants to be the one to wake dragons from stone. And she's mentioned this over and over again, only a king's blood can can wake these dragons from stone. And so it makes you wonder where she actually got this information from. You know, was it a vision or is this, you know, just a, a decent rule of thumb with magic people? You know, king's blood is really useful. But when you when it comes down to it, because she's so specific about um, King's Blood and about it waking dragons from stone, you you start to realize that it's probably part of um, the uh, Azor High prophecy itself that we're not being given because she is very very specific. She needs King's Blood in order to do this, and so so the concept is probably very very old. And um, if you look at, there was some concept art for um, the history and lore. I think it was for, for the dragons when they did dragons um, with Aegon trying to hatch blood. He, um, from the history and lore, and this is just semi-canon. This, this is neither here nor there. Um, this isn't what George wrote. It's what, you know, we get from HBO. But um, there's a picture of Aegon actually like slitting his wrist or his hand or cutting his hand and like, slathering his blood all over the eggs. Um, and so, you know, they're they're kind of hinting towards that king's blood thing right there with those eggs and, and that scene. But there is another mention in, um, let's see. Um, so the only other person that mentions the power of king's blood and king's blood being um, very powerful that's not, had not heard it from Melisandre is Maester Amen. And Maester Amen is also aware of the prince that was promised prophecy. If you look at what he's mentioned in the um, chapter where he was on the cinnamon wind and dying, he's like a, a you know a prince, a, a princess. You know, we we should have known it was the issue with the translation. Um, and so he, he it, he's saying that he's read the prophecy before, and he's the only one outside of Melisandre's circle that's talking about the power of King's blood. And so it's. It's a good possibility that within the information within the prophecy that King's Blood is a possible necessary item. And Aegon V is said to have been uh, gone searching all the way as far as a shy for books of prophecy and books of magic and finding out what to do to hatch these dragons. Um, but um, there is one thing that Maester Aemon did say. Uh, that makes you wonder what Aegon was really planning on doing. And they're talking about uh, burning dead children, and then they're also talking about hiding the baby because Melisandre wants to burn the baby. And um, John had tried to dismiss them as uh, his fever talking. Aemon had demurred. There is power in a king's blood, the old maester had warned. And better men than Stannis have done worse things than this. Okay, better men than Stannis have done wor worse things than this. There is power in King's blood. And so there, there is a possible um, hinting at what Aegon was attempting to do. Um, the, the king can be harsh and unforgiving eye, but a babe still on the breast, only a monster would give a living child to the flames. So, um, so there's also the possibility that um, when it's talking about only death can pay for life and the power of a King's blood, um, it's possible that Aegon had also read something similar. Maester Aemon knows about it. Melisandre knows about it. Um, it's hinted at in the um, history and lores uh, from HBO. It's possible that he could have been planning on sacrificing somebody. It's something that you don't want to think about, but it's there. Yeah, and uh, so that's just dropping a bomb there in the conversation. So, so Egg, who we all love, was planning on... Uh, sacrificing people at the end of his life that's uh it's a fantastic a fantastic thought a horrific thought in many ways but a fascinating one um i i think the the where i would um draw the link here across uh brian coming back to your 
the original question about death paying for life and links for summer hall was is that i think that clearly as uh, as amanda was saying um uh, clearly magic comes at a price there is always a cost for magic somewhere along the way in in this world and it does appear that sacrifice seems to be the way of it um that seems to be how you get a good magic or powerful magic in some way and when the the one time we have seen dragons being broken being brought forth from uh from stone petrified eggs whatever whatever the actual thing that was going on with danny's eggs was uh, when they were born it seems to be this wonderful confluence of so many things happening clearly there needs to be fire uh, clearly there was the red comet going overhead uh, um, but also there were deaths and there were significant deaths happening in and around that time and depending on which way you cut it and the way i cut it is that there were three significant deaths uh, one being Carl Drogo him pardon me himself it was his funeral pyre he was the greatest uh carl in the land uh, we've also got rago who died was was stillborn died in the womb apparently he was going to be the child of carl drogo and danny uh, he was clearly powerful king's blood going on there and then we had miri mazdur who was also killed in the pyre she was a powerful magician actually if you think about what she was doing she might well have just been hanging out there in Essos, but she was pretty powerful. So you got three deaths and those deaths, that sacrifice all brought forth the dragon. And if you read through that chapter, it's a fascinating chapter. If you read through that chapter, there's this moment when you realize Miri Mazdur suddenly knows what's, what Danny is trying to do and what is about to happen. And she suddenly turns from mocking her to sort of like, whoa, no, what's happening here? And it's almost as if she suddenly realizes, she adds it all up and she sees what's happening. Um, and it's, uh, so yeah, that, the reason I went through all of that is to say that yes, we needed deaths to bring forth dragons. And what happened in Summer Hall is that there were deaths. Incidentally, we know of three big powerful deaths there's Aegon himself there's uh duncan his son and there's also uh duncan the tall uh who is a pretty impressive figure himself uh so they all die and at the same time as that's happening fire blood sacrifice we get a birth and we get the birth of Rhaegar. So we get a figurative dragon being born uh, who, uh, so yes, you could say there was definitely an attempt at some magic and the, what happened at the same time was a birth of a dragon, a new Targaryen. So at, at the very least symbolically, that is what was going on, uh, was that there was death paying for life. So whether or not there was actual big magic that therefore brought forth Rhaegar is is uh, a, a lot bigger issue that perhaps probably deserves a, a live stream on its own. What what actually was Rhaegar's role? But uh, Brian, we I think we gave quite a, a a big answer to that one. We've got another couple of excellent super chats that I want to get onto as well. Um, Nine nickels. Uh, with a fantastic point saying, I always thought the ghost of High Heart probably met Lyanna by Rhaegar bringing her to Summer Hall, and that's why she freaked out when she saw Arya. Uh, Arya, of course, bore a strong resemblance to Lyanna that Ned noted this uh, a few times. Now, I, for the first half of that, I, I would say, and I'm this is probably in about three videos time in my series of what um, uh, what I think happened in Robert's Rebellion up to the Tower of Joy. Um, I think that, yes, there's a fairly good chance that Rhaegar did indeed take uh, Lyanna to Summer Hall. It's sort of on the way, if you look at it, uh, from where they were in around about Harren Hall down to the Tower of Joy. So it's roughly along the same kind of route. Uh, and given how much he liked it and given the, the place, given the, uh, the fact that he was clearly driven in some way by prophecy, it makes sense that they go there. And it makes sense that the ghost of High Heart was there as well. So it makes sense that he saw her there. 
in terms of the second part of what you say is that's why she freaked out when she saw Aya. I'd not really thought about that before. Yes, that's possible. But I think that she actually, because she was powerful, she knew that that was Aya. And as we said earlier, the reason for her being freaked out was not her mistakenly thinking that she was Liana, but her knowing what was in store for Aya. Did you have any thoughts on that, Amanda? No, I think that that's a, a really good observation. I had never actually considered the possibility that um, the ghost of High Heart might have actually met Leanna. Um, we're not really sure at what point she went from Summer Hall to High Heart. There was, you know, she definitely got there at some point in time, but we we, we really don't know when. And um, it, she might have moved when Rhaegar stopped visiting her. Um, that could be a possibility. So, you know, Rhaegar loved the place and he probably wanted to know what was going to be happening, He, you know, with the war with Lyanna. And so uh, I think that'd be a pretty smart thing to do would be to visit her, to be honest with you. Um, so that's that's a big possibility. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, and and I think in terms of the timing, the only bit of evidence that I've got so far well the two bits are firstly that she says she gorged on grief which seems to to me to imply she was there for a period of time and secondly the rumors of the ghost of high heart being there only seem to surface in the books this seems to be a new thing which seems to me to imply that she only got there relatively recently it's not that oh there's this character who's been there for decades or something so i think that for me it was a relatively recent sometime around the beginning of the books, perhaps. But uh, yeah, I also like that thought that maybe she moved up when Ray Gus stopped visiting her. That that makes sense. Um, uh, Jace, uh, thank you very much for your super chat. Why do you think someone so accurately prophetic and gifted stays out of the fray when others like Melisandre are running around doing so much damage. So why is it that the Ghost of High Heart just sort of hangs around on her hill when others are doing stuff? I mean, I think that the the human answer to this, if human is the right word here, is that she's traumatized. She's, uh, she, uh, all that she's she says is, is she's remembering her friend. She seems to have some sort of PTSD is probably the wrong way of saying it, but she's got some sort of uh, a huge hangover from what happened at Summer Hall that she just hasn't managed to get past. And I personally think that she is responding to direction from the Weirwoods, and the Weirwoods presumably haven't told her to go anywhere and do anything, so that's why, however, Melisandre is doing stuff off her own bat. So that's my own personal take. Have you got a, an, an, anything to add to that, Amanda, about why you think she's just sort of hanging out there rather than wandering around doing stuff? Well, I mean, we, we learned from the beginning that that wasn't always the case. She was there in the fray. She was at court. She was providing um, everybody with her visions. And um, I, I think that it's just she learned a very, very hard lesson um, when when that happened. Uh, you know, people died and it's quite possible that, you know, what she had to say had a hand in it. So um, she's very, very sorrowful. And it's not that, you know, she's, you know, that she's always stayed out of the fray. It's just that she was very, very hurt. And um it, it stopped, but it wasn't always the case. So, yeah, I, I, that, that, that's right. So it wasn't always the case. Then Summer Hall happened, and after that, she seemed to stay there and then go up to High Heart, and that seemed to be it. We don't have any other uh, idea of her movements. So, uh, yeah. I, I think there is some sort of trauma, clearly, that's that, that's still going on there. Kid28, thank you so much for your super chat. Um, uh, and, guys, I think we're probably going to only do it around another five or maybe ten more minutes. So if you do have any more questions, now is the time to just drop them in there. Um, uh, Kid28 says, could the deaths at Summerhall have paid for the lives of all of the Mad King's children since he seemingly couldn't have any prior. So this is uh, a reference to the fact that Eris and Rayella, um, after Rhaegar, there were 
six, seven perhaps children uh, that there that were there with either miscarriages or stillborn or were born and died uh, it, when they were still infants. Um, and this this happened, and this is why there was such a big gap between Rhaegar and Viserys, because it wasn't that there just wasn't anything going on it was that they nearly had a lot of children and they all died very young and so the uh, the, the question is why now uh, there have been lots of theories put forward for this uh, Eris uh, went uh, off on this great sort of walk of penitence uh, and ended up chatting uh, away to the high septum and, and saying, well, I'm never going to sleep with another woman again. And then after that, uh, Viserys appeared and he seemed to think that this was it and it was all miraculously done. I've heard uh, a really interesting theory that perhaps this was the maesters in the same way that they poisoned the dragons. Perhaps they were also trying to poison and end the Targaryen line because let's face it, at that time, it was quite small. There, there were in the past quite a few Targaryens hanging around, but now they'd, because they'd only been marrying them, each other, that they got quite small. So perhaps that they were that the maesters were poisoning them. Uh, but here, uh, Kid28 is suggesting that perhaps this is Summerhall, the deaths uh, uh, in going on there, also paying for the door. The deaths of, of his children were being paid for what was going on there. So uh, what do you think to, to that, Amanda? Do you think there's any link between Summerhall and Eris and Rella's children? Well, I don't think that it would it would have been a purposeful sacrifice, you know, for the lives of his children because he didn't know at the time that his wife would in the future have those issues. Um, now, are the, those deaths? It, they just aren't in this, in enough proximity, in my opinion, to you know have paid for the the future, you know, the future lives of of those other children. And, and so, um, you know, unless he's talking about Rhaegar himself, but like I said, he he didn't know that his wife would, would have future problems w with childbirth. And so I don't think that it was purposeful. And when you're talking about death paying for life, we do have some people dying and we do have Rhaegar being born. And so you can think of it in, in that sense. And, and it, you know, you, don't, you re never really know what those, you know, very mysterious concepts, you know, um, I'm sure that they thought that a dragon was going to hatch or be born, and, and he actually did. And so, you know, did did those deaths pay for Rhaegar's life? Um, maybe, probably not, um, because children are born all the time uh, with, you know, no problems. Um, and so it, it's just one of those things where it's just really hard to kind of nail down what exactly was going on on there. And I, I honestly, I think that it was just um, a, a complete debacle or sabotage. Um, so it, it's really hard to say there. Yeah, and, and Kid28 is now saying, uh, sorry, got the timeline of Rhaegar and the stillbirths wrong. Um, no need to apologize. This, this is a, quite deep stuff we're getting into here. Um, so uh, I think I'd agree though, incidentally, I think that uh, it's uh, there is not a direct link going on there. I, I'm quite partial to the idea that the maesters perhaps were involved in a little bit of poisoning um, because they did that to the dragons. And when Marwyn is talking about what the, the maesters were doing, he says, and they killed the dragons and that doesn't, uh, you know, the dragons is a way of talking about the Targaryens as well. So it's possible that he was saying that. Um, but I haven't actually seen any real evidence of it, to be honest. I like the idea, but I haven't seen any evidence uh, for that. Uh, Brian Price, thank you so much. $10 super chat. That's very kind. Uh, a Tyrion chapter in Game of Thrones describes Dragonbone as strong as steel, yet lighter and far more flexible, impervious to fire. Bows are made with it. Could this be the secret to Valyrian steel? Oh, now we're getting into the secret of Valyrian steel. Um, uh, where, 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 where do you, are you a Valyrian steel expert, Amanda, or shall I give my uh, two pence first? Um, no, but I, I do know a bit about books in the series, different books. And that was actually the engines of war that he was reading um, around that time when he was reading about um, the, the properties of Dragonbone. And it's a Valyrian um, book itself. It, so 
Um, what do you think about Valyrian engines of war? Engines of war are different things that you would um, build in order to, like catapults and stuff like that, in order to, um, uh, you know, wage war. And so when you're looking at um, an engine of war and what you what Valerians would possibly need, um, Valerians would possibly need something that um, could kill a dragon. And so he was probably reading about a contraption similar to um, what we see in the show. And so um, it, when, when he's reading about this, this bow and these engines of war and the properties of dragon bone, he's probably reading about um, basically like a, a, the contraption that you see in the show where it's a huge bolt. Uh, what are those called? I forget. <laughs> but um, The scorpions. The scorpions, that's right. And so he's, he's probably reading about the engines of war with, with that, um, with the scorpions that can be built to, in order to kill dragons. And so um, I don't think that it's, necessarily specifically trying to reference the ingredients to valerian steel it could be they're high in iron um you know it's a metal um and they're it's black and the valerian steel is black so that that is a possibility um i i have some other ideas and if you look at some of the sigils it, it may point to possibly um the trees themselves providing some ingredients so there's there's that yeah, I go. I go with uh, dragon glass being a, a, a constituent part of Valyrian steel. Myself, I think that the 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 blackness and also, incidentally, um, dragon glass isn't always just the same color. When there's this, uh, I did a little bit of research following a question a couple of weeks ago in a, a super chat, um, uh, asking about the the camp. This is a complete digression. Apologies, people. Um, but uh, in in the the citadel, they've got four glass candles. Three of them black, one of them green. And someone was asking what the significance of their one being green was. And uh, that if you start thinking about or researching that, you get to the fact that in a throwaway comment, comment Stannis, when he's talking about the mines, uh, the dragonglass mines on Dragonstone, he says, yeah, and they're, they're, they're all kinds of colours. There's black, there's green, there's purple, there's whatever. So I think that, that the fact that you can have dragonglass of different colours also perhaps could uh, help uh, show or explain the kind of the rippling effect uh, and the coloured effect that there are in some uh, of the Valyrian steel blades. But um, it's the kind of thing that we don't have a definitive answer on, uh, I'm afraid. I think we've got time, guys, for one more question. Um, and uh, Amanda, I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, to pick something out from the chat while I'm just very quickly going to... Uh, uh, pick up on Susan Dunkel, uh, who was one of my uh, patrons who asked over on Patreon about prophecy, um, which is a sort of obviously a link to what we're talking about here, but was asking particularly about the White Walkers and the cave drawings and the symbols left uh, by them, which I think it must be a show reference, if you remember in the show when they're in the, the mines that we were just talking about, uh, then there were lots of symbols on the wall. Um, uh, whether or not these symbols are to reminding people about a, a timing or an appointment for their return. Um, uh, so perhaps this is uh, actually the, the the Night King and the White Walkers keeping an appointment in some way to come back. I, I, I like the idea. I think that the implication of the the cave drawings on the show is that they're very much from the Children of the Forest or the First Men rather than the White Walkers themselves. Um, so I don't think that's what's going on there. I think that uh, if I were to start talking about why the White Walkers have returned now, that again, that's an entirely new live stream. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right this time, this time, uh, uh, Susan, but I promise you I will uh, on a future live stream. Um, but uh, I think that the idea that it is timed with uh, the, the sort of the the movements of magic over time, I think, is a very powerful point because clearly the, you get the red comet going over, uh, which is the herald, as 
people like Old Man uh, saying the Herald of Dragons, and clearly it was overhead when the dragons were born, and I say, think that this was all part of the bringing of magic back, and so there clearly is a kind of a, a time uh, and magic working together in these kind of ebbs and flows. Uh, but that's that's just touching on what's quite a big issue there, and I promise I will come back to uh, what I think is happening with uh, the others, the White Walkers, before we get to Season 8, So, uh, which actually isn't as far away as you might think, people. So it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, perhaps within six months, who knows. Uh, but uh, Amanda, uh, what, what have you found in the chat that perhaps we can uh, answer as the final question? Oh, there's a question uh, by Wiz the Smith about the kiss of life in High Heart. Um, let's see. And I don't see that. Wiz the Smith, do you want to repeat your question? Okay, well, while, uh, while we're doing that, do you want to just quickly, um, uh, Wisdom Smith, if you want to just drop that question again in the chat, and we'll pick up on that in just one second. Uh, Amanda, do you want to remind people where they can find you on the internet? Yes, yeah, so uh, my channel is called The Disputed Lands. Um, I have a few videos out. Um, I mostly focus on Ironborn um, theory and about Ironborn history and culture. Um, I do have some other videos out, and like I said, I will be um, switching gears and doing, I, I believe it's going to be a three-part series of, about King's Blood, and my first video is going to be on the Voice in the Flames. So um, that should be about, I'm hoping two weeks or so that it should be out. So be, be on the lookout for that, and you can also find me on Twitter at crowfood underscore SD. Fantastic. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, so I think we've got Wisdom Smith. Thank you very much for putting that in. Uh, the question is: The Ghost of High Heart tells Thoros, this is Thoros of Mir, that his powers don't work, but the Kiss of Life works. Why is that? Do the old gods facilitate that? Um, Bran sees visions in the fire in Blood Raven's cave. So uh, I think that. Uh, so there's a couple of bits here. The first is about. Uh, why is it that Thoros' uh, kiss of life works, whereas clearly in the grand scheme of things, he doesn't look like the world's best or most efficient uh, priest of the Lord of Light? Why, why is that? Okay, so um, it is said that, the, um, that there is a ward on the Ghost of High, on the um, uh, high Heart, it um, it's mentioned that uh, Arya asks if he can see anything in the flames, and, and uh, Thoros responds, "Not here, not now." And um, it's also echoed by the Ghost of High Heart that it's not going to work there. And so there is that hint that we're that there is a ward on the High Heart, just like there is on the wall, just like there is on Storm's End, just like there is um, in the cave in Brand's cave. So. Um, now the question is about the kiss of life. Why? Why can, does it work? Um, why does it work then? And the kiss of life did not happen um, on High Heart. It actually happened um, near a, a, a stream, and so I think it was the Ruby Ford, uh, I believe it was. And so there was no war going on. There was nothing uh, prohibiting that type of magic at that time, and that's why he was able to use those rollover type powers. Now, um, I don't recall the specific instance where Bran sees visions in the fire in Blood, Blood Raven's cave, but I'm sure that that's a good possibility. Um, now, Bran, his, as far as we know, his power comes from the old gods. And so it, it's possible that they could work through, through flame in that way. Um, but um, it, it's, if that is the case that he sees visions in the fires, it, that is a good question that I, I don't necessarily have the, that answer for. Um, and do the God, do the old gods facilitate? Um, okay. Oh, do the old gods facilitate the kiss of life that, that um, worked for cats? Um, it's hard to say what, 
where magic comes from and, and where powers come from. Um, George has said that he does not make gods, he makes religions, and it's more of a cultural phenomenon. And so it's hard to say where this power comes from or where that power comes from, or if there is much of a difference between this or that, between Rolor and the old gods or Rolor and the drowned god or the drowned god and the old gods. It could actually all be stemming from the same power. And so it's very interesting looking at, you know, what works where, because Melisandre is obviously, um, you know, her power is supposed to stem from Rolor, but when she goes to the wall, she says that her powers are stronger there, but there's supposed to be that ward on the wall that we see again with that sample chapter where the dragon cannot go over it. So for some reason, she is a, a, a priestess of Rolor, but her powers get stronger there. But for some reason, there's also a similar ward there. So I, I'm not sure how George has decided what works where and what doesn't. Um, it's definitely something to look at. I don't know, have you looked at that, Robert, before, the, the different wards? Not the wards specifically. I think what I would say is that uh, we often think about the types of magic as being completely different and completely separate. That's certainly not how it appears to be. There are so many instances of uh, thematically different types of magic sort of crossing over. If you just look at Patchface, he talks about fires under the water and things like that. If you uh, if you look, and I've already talked about the, the thematic links between Blood Raven and Beric, it's not just that. They seem to be in some way working together. Now, the, the, both of them are thematically half fire and half power of the old gods. But also, when you just take, say, Lady Stoneheart, for example, she di didn't just magically wash up on a shore. She got dragged out of the water by Nymeria, clearly old god kind of stuff going on there. And then Beric gave her the, the final kiss of life, passing his life essence on into her. And so actually, that was, if you look at it, that was somebody... The, the powers of the old gods working together with this kind of god from the, the power from the Lord of Light. And that is shown, that, that kind of link up is shown when you get Beric, who is very much associated with, because he is a fire white, he is sitting in the throne of weirwood roots. And so there's a link between them. So I think we need to stop thinking about these things as being separate and start trying to see where the links are, because there seems to be things are coming from the same sort of source. And George R. R. Martin, I agree when he's saying he's not creating gods, he's creating religions. We're not going to see the gods. We're not going to, the, the, the gods, as far as this story is concerned, actually don't matter and don't exist. What matters is the belief and what matters is what people do with the fact that they believe in a certain god or they believe in uh, a prophecy or something like that. That is what George R. R. Martin is wanting us to focus on, not the truth on whether or not there actually is uh, a, a Lord of Light or a Great Other or anything like that. He doesn't. That's that's not going to be a part of the story. What part of the story is the the impact of belief in those things and what how that drives the action. Uh, all of which I think has taken us slightly away from where we started, which was the Ghost of High Heart. But I think that, that it's probably quite a good way to sort of end it up because the Ghost of High Heart is another one of these instances of somebody who's very clearly part of this kind of the old gods world. And yet she comes into the Targaryen court. So she is coming into this place of fire and she's going over to Summer Hall, which again is this place of fire. And so she is at the, the heart and the center of this kind of link up between the old gods and fire that I personally think is exemplified and in many ways kicked off by Blood Raven with his kind of his, his dual heritage of these two uh, types of magic. Um, but that's, uh, I, well, my attempt to draw this back around to, to something that sort of like uh, is, is where we started. So the ghost of High Heart is not just about the old gods. The ghost of High Heart is about the old gods going to meet and work with and through fire magic in a way.
Uh, but guys, uh, I've slightly run over time. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for, for sticking around. We had some fantastic questions, which is why we overran a little bit. Um, uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, guys, uh, please do check out The Disputed Lands. Uh, it really is an excellent channel. As I've, you've already seen uh, on this live stream quite how much knowledge uh, and uh, fascinating insight Amanda can bring to just completely random subjects so uh, please do go and check out her channel uh, if you are at all interested in supporting this channel please do check out my patreon page there's a link down there in the description uh, and guys we'll be back here uh, at the same time next week uh, for another live stream don't know the topic yet or the guest but uh, I've got quite a few good guests lined up so uh, uh, please do tune in to find out thank you again so much for the super chats and the fantastic questions we got uh, guys I shall see you all again next week take care